which is good evening, it's good to see you in Baragam, which is the traditional language of the community that I grew up on the Darling Downs. Good evening, everyone. I'm Vicki McDonald, and it's my great privilege to be the State Librarian and CEO here at the State Library of Queensland. And on behalf of my colleagues, I welcome you to our third and final Game Changers event for 2021. I begin by acknowledging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their continuing connection to land and as custodians of stories for millennia. We are inspired by this tradition in our work to share and preserve Queensland's memory for future generations. I extend a warm welcome to our guest speaker, Dr Glenn Richards, founding manager director of Green Cross and co-founder and director of Pet Barn. Our facilitator, Peter Ellis, co-founder of Tribe Global and entrepreneur in residence at QUT, members of the Library Board of Queensland, Queensland Library Foundation Council and the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame Governing Committee. And also a warm welcome to Amanda Goodmanson, who is the Executive Dean of Business and Law at QUT. I also welcome our um, generous sponsors, Picture Partners, Channel 7, Morgans, NAB and RACQ. And as well, of course, our friends and supporters, it's fantastic to see you here this evening and also online. The Game Changers series is an initiative of the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame, a partnership between QUT Business School, State Library of Queensland and the Queensland Library Foundation. Game Changers brings together innovative leaders from business, technology and creative industries who encourage us to challenge our thinking in bold new ways. Queensland Library Foundation is a founding partner of the Hall of Fame and works to support our projects and services. Please consider making a tax-deductible donation to help us to preserve the state's unique history and culture for future generations. Tonight, we will hear from Dr Glenn Richards. The pandemic spurred a huge rise in pet ownership across Australia. I just have to look at my coffee shop on Saturday mornings to see that. <laughs> um, through lockdowns and changing restrictions, our furry friends provided comfort, activity and Zoom content at a time when we needed it most. We're also spending more on our animal companions, which brings me to Dr Glenn Richards. At 27, he bought a small vet practice in Townsville. Within 10 years, Glenn developed five vet clinics and a large format pet store in Townsville as well as two veterinary hospitals in China. He went on to build a multi-million dollar integrated pet care empire, which now operates more than 200 hospitals in Australia and New Zealand. You may also remember seeing Glenn as a resident panelist and investor on Channel 7's Shark Tank series. It is a pleasure to have Glenn at State Library tonight, and I look forward to hearing him shortly. This evening's conversation is being broadcast on Facebook Live and on the State Library of Queensland website. We will use Slido to collect questions from our online and in-person audiences. So to participate, go to slido.com and enter the event code QBLHOF or simply scan the QR code that appears on the screen throughout the event. Our facilitator, Peter, will do her best to get to as many questions as possible. And if you are sharing your thoughts about tonight's conversation on social media, we encourage you to use the hashtag QBLHoff. So before I leave you this evening, I'd encourage you also to visit some of our State Library of Queensland exhibitions. You'll need to get in quick to see Entwined, Plants and People in our State Library of Queensland Gallery before it closes next weekend. And it has some beautiful treasures on display and some of those are on display for the first time in decades. So do pop along to that exhibition. And if you are passionate about the power of photography, visit Viewpoints on Level 4 to reflect on the uh, captivating work rather of three contemporary Aboriginal photographers. But for now, please join me in welcoming Peter Ellis and Dr Glenn Richards to the stage. Thank you. We had a practice at this before, so... I'm sure our voices are projecting efficiently to the back of the room. So thank you for joining us. Um, I have the pleasure of chatting very candidly um, to Glenn this evening and hearing a bit of a background story. So we're going to go on a bit of a journey tonight. 
Um, yeah. Whether you know this or not, not only, we're not just going to ask the basic questions, but we're going, to, we're going to hear the human story, the human behind the brands, and also because I know that how you make decisions in investing into other companies is really to do with a human-based decision. So I'm keen on unpacking that as a theory and a concept, but first of all, I want to um, bring attention to something that's written on your LinkedIn, which is work harder, longer, smarter than your competitors to win at the great game of business. So that seems very competitive, Glenn. Do you uh, play life by those rules or is it just business? Um, if you play golf with me, Peter, you know I'm horrendously competitive. I, I come across as fairly humble, but once the, uh, a competition starts, for some reason, that gets the juices flowing. And, and you know, it was the same in, in Green Cross days when we, we looked at competitors how do you out smart, out manoeuvre, out work, out whatever your competitor? Because at the end of the day, business is very much about, and not in a ruthless way, but just in a way that says, I'm trying to win my market share, I'm trying to win my customer, I'm trying to do a better job, a better service, a better product, all those pieces of the, of, of the pie to win the hearts and minds of the customers. And so it's competition. And I know my creative juices and my, my resilience, my, my tenacity gets better every single day that I fire up and, and uh, look at the competition that I'm competing against. And I get, once you know, the competition's not great, you get a little bit mellow. And I think all of us in business need to keep a little bit of an eye on the competition to keep, to keep that creativity and that, that tenacity going. I'm so watching these slides come up and that's, that's <laughs> intriguing me who supplied Who's, them. And I'm where are they coming from? That uh, there's probably Nikki Bassetti in the room <laughs> somewhere. Who's sensories and photos? Um, so in terms of with entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship or people in business or anybody's got an idea or somebody wants to be innovative, there is the word competition comes up a lot in terms of comp competitiveness, wanting to win, want to be better, the desire to continuously improve. I'm always fascinated to know if the entrepreneur in you was born or was it created. So can you go back to when you were young as a child uh, and talk us through your, your natural behaviour. Was it competitive? Did you always want to seek out to be better or to improve? Yeah, you know, I think if you had the psychologist in the room, when you're the third-born child, your job is to try and beat those ahead of you, isn't it? And uh, but you know the reality is, I grew up in Western Queensland, um, which was a great upbringing in terms of learning how to work hard, uh, working as a family, um, and business was always at the family uh, dinner table because we worked as a as a uh, we owned great sheep and cattle stations in in Western Queensland near Richmond, and so. It, growing up in a small business um, environment, you are always thinking about how to do things better, how to survive, how to get... You have to innovate, really. You have, you have to. And I'm sure, when I look back, um, I was competitive, I keep saying, probably not in a ruthless way, just in a competitive way because of the fun of, of the game and uh, everything from you know, sports through to getting my report card from my teacher in about grade three and the teacher wrote... He's the only boy in the class that gives the girls any competition. So, you know, it was probably in there somewhere. <laughs> so, um, I did also know that you went to boarding school. Yeah. And uh, I, I have children and I couldn't, I couldn't imagine sending them away and not seeing them week to week uh, or day to day. Um, but it's a, it look, it's a reality for a lot of families, not just back then, obviously, when you were younger, but definitely now as well. And it is very much a reality for people in the regions. But it also does breed different level of resilience and grit and um, the ability to manage oneself on their own. Did you learn that early because of boarding school or is it, or is it part of something, that, a skill set that you brought in? Did you, did you, first of all, did you like it? And did it sort of build up that internal resilience? Well, I think the, the, two, to, the two big influences, growing up in Western Queensland where, you know, Dad would put you on the tractor and say, stay on that tractor and delve the bore drain, which is clean out the drains to, to make water flow out of the Great Artesian Basin to, to dams. And so sit on there and you do that for you know, 12 hours as a, as a 10 year old. And, and he'd come There's and no check devices. It. No devices. No, no end. devices. You just sit there and, and get very bored. And so <laughs> a degree of you build up resilience, sitting on a horse while you're driving cattle uh, or driving sheep uh, all day. And, and, and you know, flies are buzzing. You got your fly veils on to stop getting bung eye. So that resilience uh, in most country kids comes at a very young age. Um, but from a boarding school point of view, those of us who are sent away to boarding school because 
you know, you need to further your education and, and um, at the end of grade six, um, my parents and I decided it was time to, to head to uh, boarding school. So I went to the Southport School uh, on the Gold Coast. And, and that's pretty tough. And I still remember, because it was my decision to go a year early with, uh, and I said to Dad and Mum, I think I need to go a year early. I'm, I'm not growing enough at <laughs> Richmond State School. So off I went to Southport. Anyway, they would always come down on the family holiday to, uh, to, the, to Surface Paradise, and they dropped me off. And, uh, and they came back a week later. And uh, as a 12 year old, burst into tears and said, I don't want to stay here. I think this is a mistake. You need to take me out. And uh, well, service <laughs> broke their paradise hearts. and country Queensland are a little bit different. Oh, so. but it used to, you know, anyone who's a mother or father know that you know, it breaks their heart when you, when you do that to them. So they're all in tears. Mm. Uh, I'm in tears. And, but every, every holiday. So you only got to go home three months out of 12 months of the year. So you'd get home. Full of, and I had five, uh, there were five children in the family, and the whole place would fill up, and it'd be chaos and mayhem. And then, you know, two or three of us would be sent off to boarding school, and everything would calm down. Calm down, and it would break my mother's heart. I remember my dad telling me there were always tears. Well, that's a that's a lesson in resilience for her as well. A absolutely, but you know, when you go through, through, but when you go through boarding school, back to that resilient question. All boys uh, from grade seven onwards, you, you don't show emotion. You, you just have to be in a position where there is no weakness. Mm. And, and not, not in a nasty way, it's just protective me mechanism. And you know, there are people in those environments that go after the, the weak, weakness in your armour. So you don't show any weakness. And you know, I guess part of my job was to keep an eye out for the bullies to make sure they weren't going after anyone else at the same time. But, you know, it's a tough, tough environment. And I look back now and I see that as part of, uh, as a business person, taking so long uh, to seek out mentors in my business career because you didn't want to show a weakness uh, in your armour, a weakness in your capability. And I think that came all the way back from, from boarding school days. It's having to tuck it away. Yeah, and I guess my wife would argue also, from an emotional <laughs> level, it's hard to is pull the out the vulnerability there. <laughs> the vulnerability, and it is damn hard. And it wasn't until I was about yes. 40 to realise that it is okay to seek out mentors, mm. uh, to seek out friends and family, to, to show some vulnerability where they can help you with some of your, your weaknesses. And, and uh, that is probably the number one thing I say to uh, my, my CEOs, my startups, my founders, seek out mentors because don't do it too late. Don't think it's a weakness in your armour. Think of it as the vulnerability that will help your business survive, that you'll have mentors that will help you de-risk um, your journey because you will find, and I call it the menagerie of mentors across a range of subjects that you seek out and have regular catch-ups, be it coffee, lunch or whatever, to help you on your business journey. And once you realise that that's important, and I, as I did in my 40s, way too late. I reckon I would have done the Green Cross thing five to ten years early if I'd had the right mentors. Can I just ask a question around the, either the vulnerability and also mentorship because it is so powerful. Um, and a lot of people think they need to have everything sorted before they get a mentor, or they're not, they need to be doing something important to be coached. I got asked this this week, actually. Uh, somebody said, I'm not doing anything special enough to get coached, opposed to seeking out the, uh, the advice or the, the mentorship or the, the wisdom from somebody who has walked the path beforehand. So what would you say to somebody who feels that they're not ready, they don't really know what they should be asking, what would they even ask a mentor? Um, so as the mentor or the guider, as the person who could guide somebody through the journey, what do you see on the other side that you would love somebody to come to you with? You know, I, I look at the 20-year-olds the that come through and they don't know what they don't know, so they don't know to ask. And, and it's, I call it a humble arrogance or arrogance in humbleness. That, that they just don't know, so therefore they're not willing mm. to seek out mentors. And uh, I look back at a... Uh, you know, when I first when I first moved out of the management team at Green Cross, and, and I was getting a golf lesson from uh, a guy called Gary Calder, and I'm smacking golf balls down the, the fairway, and he's trying to improve my driving, and uh, and he said, "Do you want to improve your golfing capability, your driving?" I said, "Absolutely." And he said, "Well, I need you." Um, and and he, well, he asked me, he said, "Well, where are you aiming?" I said, "I'm aiming down the fairway, just to the right of the bunker." And he said, OK, well, I think there's some of your issue. I need you to look up and I want you to start aiming at that cloud up there in the sky and 
start trying to hit golf balls at that cloud. And so after about 15 golf balls, and anyone who's a golfer knows, you know, you look up and flow through. And so I started trying to bang golf balls at this cloud. And sure enough, after about 15 golf balls, I was hitting straighter and longer uh, than I had been hitting. And I said, Gary, are you some sort of magician? What have you just done? <laughs> and he said, what I've done is I've lifted your line of sight. And, and I have this strong belief that you need a circle or a menagerie of people around you, be it parents, coaches, uh, teachers, um, fellow business people, fellow uh, operators of business as peer mentors as well, to help lift your line of sight. And, and one of the things I do the most now is simply say to my entrepreneurs or founders that I'm involved with, um, tell me about the journey, tell me where you're trying to get me, tell me your vision, and then I push them a little bit harder around that vision if I think it's achievable. You know, some turn up and they're, they're going to dominate the world and you go, I can't help you. You know, I can probably help on the execution, but I can't help lift your line of sight. But a lot of businesses, you know, they, they need a little bit of a push and a shove and a, and a lift up on where they're thinking and how they're thinking and how they might scale up to achieve, to achieve the next level. Mm. So back in uh, 1994, when you were um, starting out in, in Townsville, were you, did you have that line of sight or were you really looking at starting your very first practice? Look, 1994, I, I was um, finishing up a job in London and um, I decided it was time to come back and I, and I wanted to go back to Townsville. I'd done a research master's in Townsville at James Cook Uni. So I rang a vet practice in Townsville on speculation, just rang them out of the blue and said, look, uh, I know you've got a little branch practice. Um, how do you feel about selling me your little branch practice because I'm coming back from uh, England? And they said, look, we're about to put our main hospital on the market and the branch practice comes with it. Um, and within about seven minutes, we'd had this conversation backwards and forwards with, with Carol and Michael uh, about their practice, about their revenue, about how many pets were in their database or in their on their books, no database in those days. And uh, seriously, within seven minutes, I'd, I'd made an offer for their practice based on what they were telling me. They accepted and I said, I'll be back in three months. Does anyone else know it's on the market? They said, no. I said, right, don't tell anyone. I will be <laughs> back in three months. We will do the deal. We'll get the legals done and, and it'll be fine. Hung up and went, what have I done? You know, as, as any of us who have been in business know, where do you get your funding? Friends, family and fools. So um, <laughs> the, next, the next phone call was uh, to my father in Western Queensland, which was the old wind-up telephone days and <laughs> the party lines where uh, anyone who knows what a party line is, you, you, you have a piece of wire strung between post to post to post and there's about six people on that line. You pick up your phone, you can talk to each other. But you used to dial up in code so you'd create a, a certain code for you to pick up. And uh, so I've rung Dad and uh, said, look, I've just negotiated to buy a vet practice in Townsville. How do you feel about um, backing me and, and uh, lending me some money and also guaranteeing some bank loans? And he hung up. As, as <laughs> Did he? he? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was an accident. So I've rung him back. <laughs> I've rung him back and I've said, Mr Bucknell, can you get off the line because I want to have a private conversation with my father. <laughs> I knew he was listening in. And so Dad said, look, can you, uh, can you put a plan together? And, and uh, I said, I'll put a plan together. So on the way back, um, I, about two weeks later, I've jumped on a train in, in Moscow, uh, the Trans-Siberian Express, to come back overland all the way back to, to Hong Kong via China and, and uh, USSR at the time. And uh, I sat in that carriage with just a sea of white outside. It was coming up to winter and wrote a business plan for a network of hospitals across Australia. So my plan started out quite simply, it was to buy a Courage on Veterinary Hospital. And um, after a week of, of uh, being cooped up in this carriage, of drinking lots of vodka with <laughs> lots of uh, Ukrainian traders, my business plan evolved from one hospital to a multitude of, of, um, of well, a national network of, of veterinary hospitals, more like a franchise system. So that was the plan. So I've turned up. Back in Australia, <clears throat> front of Dad, with the big business plan, and he said, "Why don't we just dial it down a little <laughs> bit and focus on a successful uh, purchase of this first hospital and see where you go?" So the the whole Green Cross uh, on the veterinary hospital side, the whole network development and how we thought about our practices, the the feel, um, the vibe, the ambience of our clinics, the quality of our medicine, 
um, how we supported those clinics, all uh, germinated in, in, in that business plan that I wrote on the Trans-Siberian Express. And, and uh, did I have a view? Not until I really started thinking about it and having time to think about it and went, let's start getting somewhere. And, uh, and the, the, the pet stores came along later, uh, but the vet hospitals very much was, I think we can do something big here to improve how we uh, look after our pet owners, to do something big on how we would look after our employees and our people that worked in these, these practices. Because at the time I was in England, um, one of the highest suicide rates of any profession in the UK at the time was veterinary, veterinary surgeons. And uh, I decided we had to do it better than how we did it. And that was through better support, bigger hospitals, bigger teams inside those hospitals, still be able to aspire to doing great quality veterinary medicine, um, more capital going into good equipment and good facilities to look after our pet owners. So rather than a, uh, what I thought was pretty cottage industry, we were going to improve the execution or the, or the, the way we did veterinary science for our pet owners and our pets. So back to the original question around the line of sight. Yes. Um, I think you did have a very, very um, high line of sight, but most people go to an advisor to eat, to lift their line of sight, but you had a father that brought you down to start to give you a focus on let's, let's not go to here, let, let's actually have a tangible thing we're chasing. Um, and that can be a challenge for entrepreneurs. Sometimes we, we thinking so big or too many ideas or, the, or it, we don't actually look at the first step. That's so what, who do you surround yourself with? Because I don't believe this has just come up once in your life. I'd say that this is probably uh, something that you would go through on every new idea that you have is rather than running straight for the largest thing and how can we make this giant, even though that is where you want to end up, how do you bring it back to a place where you can actually start at day one? Yeah. That's, that's a fair question because those of us who are entrepreneurial <laughs> want to go here fast. You need to start somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and look, I, th I think that planning process um, is very, very important. And, and I simply in the old days used templates and started filling out those templates around what was your marketing plan, who was your target customer. Um, let's build a financial business model around what it might look like um, as you evolve that business from one customer to 200 customers or one customer to... 150,000 customers or whatever it was going to be. Um, and, you know, it did okay for Green Cross, the Townsville days. And then when we, when we decided to come together as a cooperative and then go to corporate and then float a veterinary group um, in 2007, so we, we had uh, John Odlum and Keith Knight and, and a fellow called Stephen Coles from, Med um, from Melbourne, uh, we came together as, as a co-op and evolved that into a, a corporate model. The corporate model got out of control fast because we then decided um, we, we linked up with some, some gentlemen who had optioned up some clinics uh, across Queensland. So we had about 17 practices in a co-op. They had about 15 clinics optioned up. We hijacked their agenda and brought it together um, and listed it on the Australian Stock Exchange in June 2007. And it was a hard year. That first year of, of going from running a group of five clinics in Townsville to um, having 32 clinics, over 300 staff, um, nearly all of us in the, in the leadership team had very little experience of managing larger groups of people, larger number of sites. And um, so we were winging it to some degree. And um, my chairman at the time, at the end of the first year, said, Glenn, look, there's this guy uh, the growth faculty from Sydney are bringing to Brisbane uh, called Vern Harnish. I think it'd be a very, very good idea if we go. So um, my young financial controller at the time, Wes Coot and myself, uh, headed along with Andrew Geddes, uh, my chairman at the time, uh, to, to um, this thing called uh, the Rockefeller Habits. And I still use the Rockefeller Habits to this day in all my companies because it's a, it's a method or a process. Vern travels the world talking to CEOs and businesses and great, pulling great ideas, but one of them, or, one, or the process is very much about where do you want to get? What's the big, hairy, audacious goal? What's your vision? Bring it back to a three to five year financial targets. Bring that back to your one year goals. Bring that all the way back to 90 day resets or 90 day review of your business. 
bring that back to one week. What are you working on this week to achieve your 90 day targets, to achieve your, your one year goals? And then we get down to daily discussions around what are we working on and what's stopping us do that to be successful if we're going to achieve our big, hairy, audacious goal of our financial targets. So that, that methodology yeah. has been very important for people like me who create chaos <laughs> as entrepreneurs to get a discipline around our thinking, get a discipline around our execution, because you know we turn up every single day brimming with new ideas. And you and need you, to put it into some sort of a plan that helps everyone else around you actually slot into that plan. Co correct, and if you turn up every day brimming with ideas and dump them on the table, you hijack everybody. Yes. And the important thing was, okay, I would assemble my list of great things that we're going to do or the big roadblocks that were getting in the way and every 90 days spend the whole day with my leadership team working on the opportunities or the roadblocks that were getting in the way of our employees and our customers. And by working on those roadblocks, we'd then know what were the opportunities to go after. And that discipline and that framework is still in uh, people in, it's still in Healthier, it's in CardioNexus and those companies that I chair bringing that concept and that methodology over for a framework of success. So it gives you a framework, it doesn't get in the way of innovative thinking, it doesn't get in the way of procedures. But if, you know, if you're a fast growing company, you're probably resetting your company every 30 days. In companies I play with and, and get involved with and invest in and support, every 90 days seems to be about right. Mm. And look, there's, there's, there's your own internal um, mental models that you need to manage your own thought process. But when you're growing companies, uh, whether it's a small business, a side hustle, or anything going to the next stage. What's a side hustle? <laughs> you're all in or nothing, right? Yeah, I don't exactly. think there's anything, uh, no side hustle in your vocabulary. But some people who are working and then start something as a side hustle first before stepping into it. Um, there's usually some, some management of time, lifestyle, relationships, family. At the end of the day, you're still you're an individual human. You are a husband. You are a father. How how do you manage life and build companies of that scale? Look, it's very tough. And, and uh, my wife and I were talking to a, an entrepreneur this week, and and you accept for a while, for a period of time, that you are out of balance. There's no such thing as as you know the balanced life. There is none. When you're an entrepreneur driving a company, you accept you are out of balance and you try to preserve um, your relationship with your, 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 your family, number one. Try and preserve your relationships with very close and dear friends and after that everything else is a bonus because your focus is growing a company, assembling the right people, um, doing whatever it takes. And I remember uh, I said to Lisa, um, we've got this opportunity to, to, um, to go to Brisbane and to grow a network of veterinary hospitals across Australia. So that's option A. Option B is we stay in Townsville um, and we don't get involved in this, this uh, network of hospitals that, that's going to grow across the, the Australian landscape. Instead, I stay here and I'll go into politics. <laughs> and, and, uh, I think you threw that. That was, that was a trick question. <laughs> it was. I don't think she had a chance to answer properly there. Exactly. So. <laughs> Suddenly, uh, all our bags were packed and they were standing <laughs> at the door heading to Brisbane. And, and, and I, I made the commitment that when we got to Brisbane that um, and it was a tough year. Our first year, you know, we, we, um, we moved house twice, bought a, bought a new, new house in Brisbane. We, um, we had a baby and uh, floated a company. So, you know, it was a busy year. There's a lot year. going on. Yeah, really busy year. And, uh, and I made the commitment that I would be anywhere in Australia uh, between pretty much Tuesday to, to Friday, but I'd be home every Friday night till Monday morning. And, and that's how, you know, for 10 years. That's a lot. <laughs> Kudos to your, to your wife and family for, they're still um, here. for agreeing. In, and in they're the here, they're, which exactly. So they, they um, I, I did say walking in any event where your children are choosing to come along and be part of it is, <laughs> is um, a significant parenting moment. I'll be very proud of that. Yeah, and look, uh, you know, all of us who are in business, deeply need you know, a stable family life to make sure that you can go out onto the, the business paddock and do your best without having conflict at home. And you know, that only happens by having wonderful people in your life. And I agree. I think the conversation needs to be had often early to explain that um, it is actually part of your DNA and that is what drives you. You enjoy working because often people will see you work a lot of hours and poor you, you're working so hard. But what they often don't realise is a lot of those times that work pace fuels you and energises you 
and is the driver. So uh, even it, the simple conversation to explain that that is uh, how you're hardwired and that is what you enjoy, that, or there is a goal that you're chasing and this is why it's happening. I think that's spot on. You know, you are hard, hardwired that you, you get very passionate when you are chasing the right purpose and, and you hear all entrepreneurs go after that. What, 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 am I, what is my vision? And I get really excited by that vision. So I get very focused, very passionate and, and, and think that's a great purpose. And you've got to be mindful of those around you as you do that. Mm. Uh, because it is very, very lonely when you see a lot of wonderful founders uh, going through you know, multiple marriages because they're, they're not quite aware to keep you know, things right. Yeah. So um, w we had a conversation previous and you were talking about, obviously you went through the, the journey of listing um, and then obviously being a part of a company that was a listed company, but then there was a, an opportunity for you to step out the other side and take on a different role. Um, at what point did you decide and what was the trigger moment for you where you decided or, or was it made for you that well, you wanted to step back? It, it's an interesting journey. So we listed Green Cross in 2007. Uh, we reset the company in about 2008, early 2009, and then we grew top line, bottom line, nearly 27% uh, revenue and EPS for, for nearly six years straight made us one of the top 10 companies you should have bought on the Australian Stock Exchange <laughs> with over 1,500% shareholder returns. So we had a lot of very, very happy shareholders. We grew a network of hospitals uh, across Australia. We did a lot of innovative things in terms of the way we supported our people. Uh, we did a lot of innovative things in the way we supported our pet owners, um, the way we marketed, the way we developed social media. You know, it was right on that early phase of, of a lot of those technologies. We set up Healthy Pets Plus, which has over 100,000 members now of people subscribing to how to look after their pet better. Um, you know, some really wonderful things. We had a graduate program. We were taking our vets straight out of uni, giving them a one-year transition into practice to make them more comfortable um, as clinicians and supported them with mentors, one-on-one -on -one mentors right across our group. Um, we had a... Um, an RTO relationship or partnership, so we never ever re had to recruit for veterinary support staff and nurses and receptionists outside our group. So we had um, school-based apprentices coming into our practices one day a week, um, growing up to becoming our, our, our veterinary nurses, our veterinary re receptionists, our practice managers and our group area managers all evolved through just really, really understanding what the industry needed. Mm. Um, so we had a lot of great things going on. We had over 120 veterinary clinics across Australia. While all that was going on, um, I, I was a foundation shareholder. We are, started a pet store in Townsville, asked a couple of my mates to come up and have a look at it. They got very excited because they were looking for, they were retailers looking for something to do. And um, next thing, uh, Paul and Jeff have bought along with me and a couple of other shareholders a group of pet stores in Sydney called Pet Barn. Um, we had a roll-up and a roll-out strategy in Pet Barn, and over the, a period of 10 years, we, we grew a massive network of pet stores across Australia, separate to Green Cross. Um, but we did trial some vet clinics inside um, two pet stores. They were successful, and um, that helped develop the industrial logic of why we probably should put together our pet stores and our veterinary clinics and uh, we were already a listed entity as Green Cross, the veterinary hospitals, and um, both boardrooms had deep discussions around the financial logic and the industrial logic of putting those two businesses together. And it made a lot of sense when you thought about it around having share of wallet, looking after a pet owner and their pets from, from cradle to grave across retail, grooming, veterinary services and all those things. Um, what happened was the, the boards thought we'd, you know, run two divisions and we'd have a, an overarching CEO, which we put up our CEO, uh, being Jeff from Pet Barn. Uh, in 2014, we put those two businesses together and then we slammed the management teams together and it was an intrigue to watch two highly successful cultures collide and see a massive number of, of senior leaders in both organisations exit, including... Uh, the two people that have been CEOs of those businesses exit the management teams because of conflict and cultural uh, alignment wasn't happening, um, of, of jamming together 
a retail business and professional services. So you get it, you know. We, we thought that wasn't supposed to happen that way. <laughs> and I still is, look back. Never is meant to happen that it way. It wasn't meant to happen. So I exited the management team in 2014. I stayed on the board for a number of years, um, but I watched some really wonderful people exit that, that, those organisations on, in both the retail and the professional services camps. Um, a lot of them went on to help found or develop other successful organisations in retail and in uh, professional service. Mm. Um, in fact, a whole bunch of them still work with me in, in Healthier, um, our allied health, largest allied health um, organisation in Australia now with over nearly 300 clinics across Australia. Uh, but it was, a, it was an amazing thing, as I said, to watch two close cultures clash. People got very uncomfortable very quickly and we couldn't control it and slow it down and the bureaucracy bureaucracy then starts to mm. get involved in your decision making and you slow down the nimbleness of those really entrepreneurial companies or that entrepreneurial company mm. or both of them. So it was awful uh, and to see that happen was, was uh, an intrigue to me and I made the decision to, uh, and I still remember sitting there with my wife and we had a long chat and I go, it's time for me to exit and um, um, I was sitting on the beach in Noosa and got a phone call from, from uh, our our stockbroker that was deeply across our, our company, and he said, I've got a buyer for your shares. Do you really want to sell? I said, no, I don't. And they said, well, here's the price. And I went, no, I, I'm not going to accept that. And Warren said, if you want to sell, you need to accept that share price. He said, it's ridiculous. It's a 33 times price earnings ratio, which is over 20 times EBITDA. If anyone knows anything on, on the stock market, it's a crazy price. And uh, I, I said, look, ring me back in five minutes. I'll ring you back. And I swam out to sea <laughs> 200 metres and I turned around I looked back and I thought, you know, as entrepreneurs, as founders, we're always trying to get to the somewhere. To stage. Always trying to get there. And you've got to recognise when you actually do make it there. You, you, it's not first base. This is the game. And the game, we got there. And, and uh, I suddenly realised... It's just, an addiction to it, the little bit more. It's like well, just a bit further. It, and it scares me because you, you always want to keep... Yeah. Staying in the game, and it, and for some reason, I was perhaps smart enough to realise. Maybe it was Noosa. Maybe it was the <laughs> swim. Maybe your wife uh, Who said knows? the right thing at the right time. But I swam back and I said, "Sell," and uh, sold seventy percent of our shares, and said, "I'll stay on the board to try and be custodian to make sure things go well." Mm. Um, they didn't go so well, so we sold the whole company to a private equity firm out of San Francisco about three years ago. Um, for, for, for a very large sum of money. Um, it, was, it was a battle for nearly five years in the boardroom about the right strategic direction for that company. And when you realise uh, you're not making much difference and you know, you're, you let you're not being heard that well, you're probably time to exit. And mm. I won't blame either side. It's just time. You need to move on. Mm. Um, but I still worry for my founders. When you actually get to the milestone or the goal or the vision recognise it and then work out whether you want to stay in the game or transition out and bring other really smart people into your organisation to take over those mm. key roles. Um, because all, we all get tired. We all get tired after a while. Mm. It has to be sustainable. And that's really important advice um, from multi, multiple different um, perspectives there. I'm going to uh, f uh, answer some of the questions or read out some of the questions that people have been um, asking as we've been going on. So this one's from Krishaw. How do you give back to mentors given that they're sacrificing time, or that you as the mentor are sacrificing time? Um, how does somebody give back? Look, I, I think the business community is very giving and it is surprising. You know, it's simple, ask the question, you know, have you got 30 minutes to grab a quick coffee? I just want a little bit of help with something I'm working on or a decision I'm trying to make. And, and I don't mind. I actually do a lot of mentoring. Mm. And it might be a one-off, never see that person again, or I see them every month or every three months or every week through, through a crisis because you feel like it's a give back. And the, the business community is very giving mm. because we all want... Um, our, our entrepreneurs around us to be successful. Mm. It's not ruthless, unless they're competing head to head, and then I'm not going to mentor them. But if, if you know, if if they're friendly, and I, and I mentor a bunch of physios who compete against my main clinics, but they're a boutique versus mm. what we're doing. Um, so you do it, um, so and I there is no the, pain. The, the flip side to that question is, what's something that they shouldn't do, or to disrespect time when some, you've asked time of somebody? 
What are some things, what are your pet hates or, or peeves that uh, you, is a disrespect of I, I, your time? I, I like entrepreneurs to be organised. What, what do they need a hand on? What do they want to chat about? What, what's the roadblocks Come getting in their questions. way? Come, Come with questions. Come with questions or... or because it's, it's almost like a therapy session. You ask the question, tell me about your roadblocks. Yep. And, and you, you, then suddenly they're starting to unload and then you sit back and listen. Because often by them unloading, they're bringing that, that problem up through and out their mouth mm. and by doing that, it helps them solve. Um, you might not have to do much other than listen or go, look, I know people in my network that can help with that issue or you give straight blunt advice or give your reflections. And I often say, this is my thought bubble. Don't follow this piece of advice other than let it play around in your head and then go back and deal with the problem you're trying to deal with. Mm. It is my thought bubble, my reflections. It's not your solution because they're not close enough exactly. to the problem. Another one, uh, another question is, can you give some examples of innovative ways that you have supported your people? So this is from an employer's perspective of how do you support the people in your own team? Look, funny enough, I was having a, a mentoring session with one of my CEOs today and we were talking about the things to do to really engage your, your people around you and, and get them excited about being on the journey. Um, and, and so, you know, what I do like to see is a leader who deeply understands and knows everyone who's in their leadership team and in their management teams. Mm. So you actually know something personal about them rather than just... You invest know, you in the relationship. Invest in the relationship. Mm. Have a proper conversation. Um, Create meeting to, uh, um, so we used to in Green Cross, we'd meet at 7 a.m. every Monday morning as a leadership team and just have a breakfast, have a chat, what worked last week, what are we working on this week. Then we'd move into a, a series of formal meetings. Um, so we'd have an 8 o'clock meeting on general stuff, eight, 9 o'clock meeting on marketing, 10 o'clock meeting on finance, and we'd, away we'd go again. Um, we'd have, every time we got to another 10 clinics that joined our group, uh, we'd have a party, so we'd have the, the 90s party or the 60s party or the 40s party, and have a massive party to have fun. That you know, this was something together. exciting, Share and then you bring yeah. those teams in, so you show them it was a fun place to be involved with the things that we we're going to do to to support them. So, mm. you know, vets, uh, uh, you know, very emotionally fatiguing industry. We made sure they knew that we, there were people that had their back as their regional partners, or um, we had a team of psychologists on tap 24 hours a day for emotionally fatiguing clinicians and, and support staff. Mm. Um, easy access to those sort of support was important. Um, fun things that happened in each region, so we'd bring the teams together, be it, you know, whatever. So human connections is just, key just, exactly. in all the teams. B business can be, can be fun and you've got to, as a leader, try and make it fun and, and connect and, and, and then, most importantly, was around core ideology, why are we here? You know, why are you getting up every day to come into this business on behalf of the shareholders? And you had to explain the why a lot. This is our purpose. This is why we're passionate. We're doing veterinary excellence to look after these wonderful pets and pet owners and we're going to do the highest quality medicine that we can do and make sure you get the best equipment, best education opportunities, the best facilities to do your best job. And mm. you explain that over and over again. And these are our values. We work as a team. We are innovative, so if you come up with great ideas, we want to hear about them and there are easy access to... Because I knew every 90 days across our organisation that we were meeting as a senior leadership team to look at new ideas or roadblocks that were getting in the way of being successful. So we would survey every single week one employee and one... Every, every nine members the of the insights. leadership team... Yeah, we'd have to ring an employee or we'd ha and ring a customer every week and just ask them, what are we doing well? What are we doing badly? What have we got to work, keep doing, stop doing or start doing if we're going to be meeting your expectation or exceeding your expectation as an, as an employer or as a, your local vet practice? Mm. And that was so valuable. And everyone in the organisation knew that was going on, so they'd also do their, their message in a bottle, their brain dump, hey, I'm not happy about this. And I'd always say, if you're not happy about something, Tell me about it, but also try and give me a solution because I know you're worried about it more than me. Mm. And that also give me their it's two or three ideas. giving them those clear pathways to come up with solutions as well. Exactly. So it's, it's just been open and, and willing and deeply, deeply, deeply respect the people that work in your organisation, the people that fronted the front line mm. to interface with your customers. Respect that on a daily basis because you're asking people to, uh, to mm. put themselves emotionally and clinically on the line on a day-to-day, -day, mm. transaction-by-transaction basis, and you respect that. And when you get 
people in your leadership team that don't, I used to make them go out and work in the vet clinics for a couple of days to understand it. Yes. And, and, that, and that's the same we're doing in most of my organisations now. Mm. Understand what the front line does because they're the most important. Yeah, which is always taking on that customer's perspective as well. Yeah. There's been a few questions um, coming through and I want to make sure that we get them all. Uh, plus also just follow through with obviously the big question in terms of Shark Tank and uh, <laughs> being on TV and taking entrepreneurship into the lounge room. So why did you decide to go on Shark Tank? So that was a bit unfortunate. <laughs> the, the, uh... For who? <laughs> Not for us. We Probably loved Australia. It. But, no, uh... we, we enjoyed it. Um, look, I'd met Steve Baxter at a... At a Ernst Young Entrepreneurs Conference um, overseas in, in, in Monaco. We came back and, and uh, our wives and, and Steve and I decided we'd go out for dinner. Mm -hmm. And um, we've sat down for dinner and Steve said, oh, now listen, uh, John McGrath has just resigned from Shark Tank and we're looking for a new panellist to, to join Shark Tank. And I went, yeah. And he said, no, I want to put your name up. And I went, no, I'm on a sabbatical. I just finished exiting the management team. You just started saying team. no. You just learned how to say Learning no. Learning to, to say no. So this was about seven months into a sabbatical and I thought, I want a year off, a 21 years straight in business of putting it all out there, of massive amounts of debt and doing all those things. And I went, I want time off. Anyway, Steve did the old classic, <laughs> kept topping my glass up, kept topping my glass up. And no. by the end of the night was that, that classic, you know, um, get you drunk and, and ask you the hard question. And, and he quite simply said, Glenn, um, I want to put your name up. And, and Lisa, my wife, jumped over the top. Said, yeah, of course, put his, put his name up. <laughs> he, he'll be keen. And uh, so I said, he said, the worst thing that can happen is you can say no. And so anyway, they put my name up. Um, a bunch of us went down for a screen test. Um, and I was standing in, sitting in Sydney with, with Des Grundy from EY. And I said, Des, I've just gone for a screen test to, to go on the next show called Shark Tank. I've actually never seen an episode of Shark Tank at this stage. It was the second season starting. We had two weeks and uh, she said, if you get the gig, you've got to go on it. So, you know, you've got to She's have people a, around you. You do. And, and if, if Des says it, you've got to do it. You've got, yeah, got I still sort of remember it being quite pivotal. So she said, if you get the gig, you've got to go on it. I said, mm. oh, I don't know yet. So anyway, got back to Brisbane, got a phone call from the producer, Tara. She said, Glenn... Um, how much dough are you pre prepared to invest each season? And I went, oh, well, X amount. If, if there's good businesses there, yes, I'm interested. Um, all right, we want to give you the gig. You've come out you know, quite good on the screen test. You balance <laughs> off those other guys on the, the, on the show. <laughs> and we are, you've never been a screen test, so can you let us know? I said, well, I just need the weekend to talk to my family. So Sunday night, we're sitting around the dinner table, and uh, I said, right, oh, kids, and, and I'd already spoken to Lisa, and Lisa said, yes, I think you should do it. I said, I've been offered this gig on national TV called Shark Tank. And they said, what's that? <laughs> so I had, then I had to explain it about pitching and investing in young, you know, early stage companies. And they said, well, why wouldn't you do it? I said, I don't know. I, I think I'm probably worried about looking like an idiot on national TV. <laughs> And uh, they said, that's just an excuse, Dad. You always push us to have a go at school and <laughs> you having to take a go. your own advice. Yeah, they said, you've got to do it. I went, oh, OK. I've been shown a mirror. It's in my face. Yes, I've probably got to give it a go. And uh, it was great fun. You know, wonderful, a wonderful experience. Three years, three seasons. Um, got on really well, offset with, with all the sharks um, on set. It was a game of rugby. You rolled onto the set <laughs> and you simply wanted the deal and you'd do whatever it took to, mm -hmm. to get in front of whoever. Like you did see everyone's competitive side come out, yeah. which was, which but, you, which but was good um, entertainment. It was good. Well, and it was important because, one, we were making investments in early stage companies. Two, I think we were educating a lot of people across Australia about the importance mm. of the entrepreneurial community and the importance of the early stage and, and scale-up community that were trying to get somewhere. Uh, and we're also teaching people business. And I know a lot of the universities and a lot of schools actually made the students watch Shark Tank mm. and discuss why we were investing or why we were not investing in those sort of businesses. And yeah, it was used a lot in schools, which I think is fantastic. And I want to read this one question out because it directly relates to a young entrepreneur, Angus Copeland Walters from Croc Candy. He's 11 with a business called Croc Candy. This is an amazing plug. I think I've seen, I've actually seen this on Instagram. Um, he raises lots of money for charities and wants to ask your best advice for a young person, please. Who is 11 with his business? Okay, <clears throat> so my classic is tell me where you want to get to. <laughs> Show me your business plan. As my family know, 
when they are doing so you, their are you still um, adamant plan? on a business plan I am one of those old school that like throw throw your thoughts down and let's see imagine where we can get to and then we'll try and throw some numbers at it okay. so a bit of planning to think about it because your plan can always pivot and change and mm -hmm. but if you've got nothing down it's hard to understand yep. and and so I like tell me your vision tell me your plan um, tell me the people you need to help execute that plan. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about your idea. What's the opportunity? What are you solving? Um, how are you going to be unique in the marketplace with your customer? Or what is the roadblock you're solving for your industry? Mm. And tell me about that. And then let's talk about how we're going to execute. So the platforms you need to put into those businesses to be successful. And tell me the purpose or the why you think this is worth spending so much time and money. Because you only got two resources um, as a founder you need to think about your time and the people's time in your organisation and where you're going to place the capital or your money from your your back pocket, your shareholders, your family or whatever. So you've got to think about mm. those two resources and apply them wisely. And so, you know, for, for a uh, crop candy, I'd yep. be going, tell me about your plan and tell me why you're going to achieve that. Awesome. And there was another question in, in terms of what sort of advice would you give the 20-year-old Glenn? Now, somebody else also asked... Um, could you talk through any failures that you have seen um, or how you've overcome those? But they, they may tie in together, Look, if the, you're thinking the, back to when you were 20. The young Glenn, I still think I, I was um, humbly arrogant or arrogantly humble in that I, I didn't know what I didn't know, but I thought I had to be bulletproof and I wasn't vulnerable. So I was marching forward without seeking out, as I said earlier, um, m uh, mentors. And luckily, I also had a group of friends that I used as peer mentors, people that I'd ring up or have a coffee with or have a beer with or have a chat with and we'd talk out about business problems and business issues and that helped immensely. People like uh, Paul Wilson, at, uh, who was the CEO of Pet Barn, people like Daryl Holmes, 1300 Smiles, and we'd bounce off each other mm. about the, the you know, in right at the early days of just small business and as that grew up into larger mm. organisations, having those peer mentors that you trusted, they had no agenda other than to offer their advice in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that was, you know, just helping. Um, and, and in terms of, of um, failures, you know, I, I think in business, not taking it seriously enough to get help early enough. So I remember deciding to open a pet store and two more vet clinics in the same 12 month period and not really doing a good financial cash flow and a financial plan around that. Just having a quick rough and ready, yep, we'll kick it open, it should work, doesn't work. Yeah. So running out of cash... A lot of, of assumptions cash, are built into those yeah, quick plans. So running out of working capital, running out of cash and working out, okay, uh, I'm pretty much full with my credit cards, I don't want to go <laughs> back to the bank for more dough, um, where else can I get mm. cash flow support? Um, so we didn't pay... Uh, our, um, our GST and our uh, BAS for about nine months until the tax department rang up and said, you know you haven't paid your, 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 your <laughs> you know, your whole... I said, yes, yes, that's I my know. strategy. <laughs> yeah, I said, um, you know, I, I was, came clean and said, look, I was using you as the bank of the tax ban and you helped cash flow my business while those businesses have reached a point of, of success and uh, look, I can now start paying those those uh, <laughs> tax liabilities. And they said, well, and they're really good about it. They said, well, look, we're not going to charge you any penalty. We'll charge you an interest rate. Um, there was about 13%, so that's mezzanine debt funding at the time. I went, fantastic, I really appreciate it. We've got 60 employees in Townsville. So the tax department in those years was you know, very sensible. Just, we don't want to see you fail. You employ a lot of people in Townsville. And, uh, and they supported me. That's nice. So it was, was really refreshing. Mm. I wouldn't do it to them now. No. <laughs> I don't think they would let you. They wouldn't even have that conversation. But look, we, we are um, getting towards the end of our discussion because an hour has just uh, completely dissolved in front of us. There's a couple of important questions. Um, one that's rising to the top of the list is, what is who is your favourite daughter? Yeah, I can see. <laughs> and that, that question has been persistently asked since uh, this, this started. But look... So I have my favourite first daughter, my favourite second daughter and my favourite third daughter. It's called diplomacy. It is. Um, I'm really glad that they're engaged with the technology of the event. Yeah, they um, would be. They would but be. look, we, to, to wrap up, I know that you had your own business, you have grown it significantly, scaled it. 
exited, now you give your time back into other founders and other companies, your expertise. Um, I'd love you, can you take us a little bit into the future, into uh, the next 10 years, in terms of industry or trends, what are you seeing? What should we be looking towards? So, so you've worked out I do love business. Oh, yes. It's, it's a passion, it's a hobby, and it's, and it's real as, as an investor as well. I do love supporting founders. And if we look at the, the genesis of, uh, of Healthier, so that was all sports physios and my foot doctor and balanced podiatry all coming together and creating a listed entity about three years ago. We've now evolved that into optometry, audiology, psychology, uh, dietetics, uh, occupational therapy. Um, we have nearly 300 allied health clinics across Australia. So I love that, working with founders, giving them the benefit of my experience, how to get funding, um, how to pull a team together, how to scale up, how to engage your frontline people, how to get cultural right. All those things now go across a number of other businesses as well, but healthier is a good example where we have over 1,200 um, employees. It's a, nearly a 300 million or 250 million uh, market cap. So it's growing. Mm. Um, we're doing that in people in. So, look, I am passionate about business and I can't see that I would not be actively involved in supporting. And I do love meeting founders that are passionate, that are willing to be mentored, that are humble and willing to listen to other people's opinions and taking some, some investment dollars and taking some time and supporting their journey. And, and I reinforce with them, I'm not going around again. I don't want to be the CEO. I don't want to be that frontline guy because it does hurt. Uh, I did it for 10 years uh, and survived uh, and, and survived with everything intact, including my family. Uh, so I don't want to do that again, but I'm happy to be there to invest time and money into really engaged founders in whatever industry. But I guess my passion at the moment is in particular around health, and around uh, medical technologies, around innovation in health, you know, pushing the barrier around telehealth, pushing the barrier around, and I guess we've moved into human health now with, with allied health, but I can see the consumer-led position is people want to stay healthier for longer. And what happens with clinicians? Most clinicians want to treat sick people, and it's really harder and more difficult to really engage people around how to make them healthier and keep them healthier for longer. And that's part of where I can see medicine is going and having to go because the consumer wants it. That's why they're happy to have Fitbits on their wrist, why they're happy to have Apple and send their data to, to Apple and let Apple uh, analyse it. You know, Apple's just bought a, a general practice medical centre uh, in New York to work out how to help the consumer better. Because as consumers, you know, we want to be monitored, we want to be supported and we want to be coached. And the medical world has got to come over a little bit towards that position mm. rather than just waiting for sick people to come in. And it's harder. It's more fun and more heroic to treat and save sick people than it is to try and keep people healthier. I get it as a vet. And that we started that with Healthy Pets Plus. I had to come up with a way to convince my vets that they're going to spend more time on helping pet owners keep their pet healthy and they could still do the fun, heroic stuff that save pets as well. Mm. It's fascinating and it's a really exciting future that we have. Um, now, I'm conscious that there have been some questions that have been left unanswered, but we did cover some things around personal um, strategies to manage life, business. Um, but do you have one key personal habit or routine that has stuck with you and treated you well to keep you in alignment, even though you don't believe you can have alignment? Something that you do to, to maintain either your mental resilience or fitness or or personal? Look, I think it's important that you maintain your health. So, so diet and exercise is really key because if you're not healthy physically and mentally when you go into work, then you can't be as effective. So mm -hmm. exercise, I run uh, um, a lot and so that also gives me meditation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the other big one I do is the list. So every single day I look at the list. What have I got to do? today to move the dial forward? What have I got to work on? What are my priorities? And it, maybe it's related to so one of my micro, companies. Micro-focused tasks. Yeah, what are the tasks I'm doing each day to move things forward a little bit, be it in my own portfolio of activity or for one of my companies? Mm. And so that priority list is still important every single day I go, the list. And here's a whole bunch of stuff that I add each week and try and clean it up by the end of the week. 
And one last question, um, if you can do it and in, in answer it in 60 seconds from Fraser McLeod asks, the personal qualities seeking when building a team, now this gets asked a lot either, finding a co-founder, how do you find them, what are the qualities in, in those first hires of five to ten people, yeah. but I'd say the first five. So, so a founder has got to be definitely charismatic, definitely able to sell a vision, definitely full of integrity, say what they are going to do and do it uh, and be authentic and, and people are drawn to those sort of people and, and they put a team around them where they don't have to be the hero, they just have to help all the other members of their team be heroes. And I, and I love the work of Multipliers by uh, Liz Wiseman. Do you want to be the genius or do you want to be the genius maker? And as founders and entrepreneurs, if you really want to be successful, you don't have to be the hero, you just have to be the genius maker, assemble a really good team around you and create that collaborative environment so they can give their best and do their best. Mm. Really good advice. Um, we could continue this discussion for another hour, but we don't have another hour. So I have learned a lot, even though we've had, we've di we've had a lot of previous discussion and I'm from this industry, I, I understand what you're working in and with and am also passionate about supporting founders. But there's, I'm always um, appreciative when somebody shares their own personal insights and strategies, and I'm sure you have all taken away some, some tips, some tricks, some insights, and some strategies that you can apply to your own businesses and your own life. So thank you, Dr. Glenn Richards, for spending the hour with us. Can you all please join with me in thanking Glenn? Thank you. So now we'll have uh, Professor Amanda Godmanson to come and close the evening. Lovely. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, two, that's about all we've got um, for you this evening and to Dr. Glenn Richards. Thank you very much for your insights this evening. From growing up in Richmond and with the, the sense of competition and hard work instilled in you early, to dreaming big on the Trans-Siberian Express and then having a menagerie of mentors I love it. I think we've all learned something tonight, in particular, how to exit gracefully and then move on to other passions in your life. Thank you very much um, for your insights this, this evening. Uh, I'd also like to say a big thank you to Peter Ellis for your fantastic moderation and conversation with Glenn Richards this evening. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, can you please thank both Dr. Glenn Richards and Peter Ellis for the conversation. <laughs> I'd also like to thank our generous sponsors for the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame, Pitcher Partners, Channel 7, Morgans, NAB and RACQ. Their continued support of QT Business School, the Queensland State Library and State Library Foundation means that we can continue to bring you these incredible game changers conversations as well as the other initiatives under the Hall of Fame. That's all we have for 2021. Please keep an eye out on our website for the activities and events that we'll have for you in 2022, and I look forward to welcoming you back then. Thank you and good evening. Thank you.